Good afternoon, and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientist monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Andrew Nirenberg will present an update on treatment of bipolar depression. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation funds the most innovative ideas in neuroscience and psychiatry to better understand the causes and develop new ways to treat brain and behavior disorders. These disorders include addiction, ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, eating disorders, OCD, post-traumatic stress, and schizophrenia. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $408 million to fund more than 5,900 grants around the world. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Andrew Nuremberg. Dr. Nuremberg is professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and director of the Downton Family Center for Bipolar Treatment Innovation at Massachusetts General Hospital. He is a member of our scientific council, was a 2013 Distinguished Investigator Grantee, a 2003 and 2000 Independent Investigator Grantee, and the Colvin Prize winner for Outstanding Achievement in Mood Disorders Research in 2013. Today's webinar will begin with Dr. Nirenberg's presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel on your screen. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time. Following the presentation, I'll ask as many as possible in the time allotted. And now I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Nirenberg. Andy, the floor is yours. Well, thanks so much, Jeff. I really appreciate the opportunity to do this and really appreciate everybody who's spending their valuable time listening to this. And my hope is that people learn something new and can take away something from this. I'll be talking about an update on the treatment of bipolar depression. And I will be doing this in three ways. So I will have three acts for, for this particular play. Uh, first, I'm gonna talk about the brain in general uh, because that's one of the most uh, important things that's going on with bipolar disorder and bipolar depression. Then I'll talk about bipolar disorder and focus on bipolar depression itself. And then last, the last act, the third act, will be to talk about the treatments. So let's go on this journey together. So act one, the brain. So we carry around this three pound brain in our heads and it's really nothing short of a miracle. Uh, back in 400 BCE, Hippocrates said, from the brain and from the brain only arise our pleasures, joy, laughter, and jests, as well as our sorrows, pains, griefs, and tears. What Hippocrates was essentially talking about was how our brain processes these most human of experiences. And one of the things that happens with bipolar disorder is that the pleasures, joy, laughter, and jest as well as the sorrows, pains, griefs, and tears arise from the brain rather than from the outside to the extent that it can cause havoc and all sorts of dysregulations. For anyone who has experienced this, it feels like it's almost this external force. For those of us who have not experienced it, it's a little bit difficult to really understand but we live day to day feeling like these things are regulated, our responses are regulated, our brains are regulated. And if there's one word that characterizes bipolar disorder, it is dysregulation. Things are not regulated the way that one would hope they would be regulated. Well, this is the way we used to understand the brain from phrenology and bumps on the heads and having little areas of the head and the brain that have to do with things like cautiousness and 
ideality, constructiveness, combativeness. And we've come a long way from this where we understand that there are these different structures in the brains in, in brains that actually are not quite separate. Everything is connected and connected in a complex dynamic way. And now that we can look into people's brains while they're alive uh, with magnetic resonance imaging and with something called DTI, uh, which is just incredibly beautiful, you start to get a sense of how connected things are. And it's not just the wiring, it's that there are functional connections between all sorts of areas in the brain. And then if we delve deeper in looking at some of the neurons and how the neurons are all interconnected with each other, it becomes not only incredibly beautiful, but also incredibly complex. And in these complex systems, they tend to self-regulate. And if anything, it's a miracle that our brains work at all, and it's not surprising that they can get dysregulated. Once you get even further down, uh, this is called a brain bow, by the way, uh, you start to see how there are different neurons and astrocytes and other cells that form this highly complex network, which makes up the miracle of our brains. And you go even deeper and the connectome, the physical ways that all of the cells are connected is even more complex. Not only that, but these structures change all the time. They make and break connections. And it's these making and breaking of connections that can also be dysregulated and then can result in dysregulations that can be recognized as bipolar disorder. So that's the first act uh, that puts everything in context uh, because when I talk about bipolar disorder in act two and I talk about treatments in act three, really be talking about what sort of things are going on in the brain that we may or may not quite understand? And what are the treatments doing that we may or may not understand fully? But we do know what the treatments do clinically, and we have some idea of how they do them. Um, but in Act 2, I'm going to give you this overview of bipolar disorder itself, bipolar depression uh, specifically. And, uh, and, and then we'll go to act three. There's one thing that's peculiar about bipolar disorder. And the peculiar thing about it is that it's highly common and yet it is understudied and has been chronically underfunded from all of the funders to better understand the nature of bipolar disorder, the causes of it, uh, and the treatments that can be developed for it specifically. It is among the top 10 causes of disability worldwide. It is a disorder of youth with 50% of the people who develop bipolar disorder having the onset before the age of 25. It costs more than $151 billion per year in the United States. And if you add up bipolar one, bipolar two, and then other forms of bipolar, and I'll define what one and two and other is in a moment, uh, the prevalence is about 4.5% of the population. That is a lot of people. So it causes disability. It happens when people are young. They live with it for a long time. It costs a lot of money, and it's highly prevalent. Type 1 is bipolar disorder with a history of fully manic episodes. Type two is with hypomanic episodes. Now, one might think that type two is less severe than type one, because hypomanic episodes are less severe, they are shorter, uh, they cause less problems by definition, as opposed to manic episodes. But the real problem, as I'll tell you in a moment, is that they really are both quite disabling there's more depression in type two as compared to type one. And in fact, the majority of the time that people spend while ill is spent in the depressed state. 
The other thing, and I'll show you some data about this in a little while, shortly, is that people with bipolar disorder have other problems. In fact, 90% of people with bipolar disorder have something else that causes them a problem. Now, if you remember, I talked about the brain and its complexity and its beauty and its miraculousness. Well, it can get dysregulated in multiple ways. And that's why people who have bipolar disorder can be dysregulated in multiple ways, multiple spheres of dysregulation, of mood, of thought, of sleep, of appetite, of frustration, of anger, and so forth. The other thing that's very important to note is that it is not just the brain, it's the body. And the brain is a part of the body, and there is no separation between brain and body. And the other thing that occurs is that people with bipolar disorder also have chronic physical conditions. And in fact, they're anywhere from one and a half to over two times more likely to have chronic physical conditions. And it's absolutely essential that these conditions are also treated seriously and carefully. Now, there have been a number of movies in the past decade that have focused on people with bipolar disorder. So there are the fictional movies, Silver Linings, Infinitely Polar Bear, Touched with Fire. And then there's a documentary about Andy Irons uh, called Kissed by God that uh, looked at Andy's uh, unfortunately short life. Um, he en ended up dying inadvertently from an overdose and had all sorts of struggles. But it's quite a remarkable depiction of what bipolar disorder is really like. Now, remember, I told you about other conditions that people can have and other dysregulations. Uh, this is from a study by Loftus and colleagues, and it shows uh, the age of onset on the left-hand side uh, and then shows what people can develop over time. Let me get rid of that. Uh, and you can see that at the age of 15, people can develop social phobia and then eating disorders and then OCD, uh, very common to have cannabis misuse, then anxiety. And then bipolar disorder can occur between sort of the mid to late teens, most commonly up to 25 and, and further, with some people developing bipolar disorder way earlier than that and some people developing it way later. Uh, and subsequently, people can have other difficulties over time. And I'm telling you this to emphasize the complexity of treating bipolar disorder. As I said earlier, 90% of people with bipolar disorder will have at least one other problem, and you have to take care of those problems also. In this classic picture from Ellen Frank and David Kupfer. It shows phases of treatment of bipolar disorder and people going from mania, hypomania, euthymia, which is a fancy way of saying feeling okay, uh, and then minor depression and major depression. And each one of these lines is meant to show the predominance of symptoms that someone has at any given time. And as a colorful as this particular spaghetti-like plot shows, it's actually simplified. And it's simplified because there is something that is counterintuitive. What is counterintuitive is that people who are depressed can have manic symptoms. People who are manic can have depressed symptoms. And a lot of it is mixed together, not only with each other, but also with anxiety. So it's, again, uh, I just want to give you a sense of the complexity of it, and the complexity of it also sits within the depression part. So I told you before that the majority of time that people spend ill with bipolar disorder is in depression, and that in a, a landmark study by Lou Judd and colleagues, where they followed people for about 25 years, those people who have type one bipolar disorder, that's with mania, spend about 30% of their lives 
either in full depressive episodes or substantial depressive symptoms. Those people with bipolar II disorder can spend over half of their time with either major depressive episodes or depressive symptoms. Now that's with not great treatment. And one of the things that's extraordinarily hopeful is that with good and thoughtful and evidence-based treatment, that can be improved substantially. And that then now brings us to the heart of our meeting today, which is treatments. One of the other things that's remarkable about bipolar disorder is that the last treatment that was found for bipolar disorder, for specifically bipolar disorder, was lithium. And lithium was discovered in the outback of Australia uh, by John Cade. He was a very thoughtful guy and did a set of thoughtful experiments to show that it can work. Um, but ever since then, ever since 1948, all of the treatments that are available for bipolar disorder were first developed for another reason. You may remember that I said earlier that it's been understudied and underfunded, and the pharmaceutical companies tend not to say, we want to develop a treatment for bipolar disorder, and we're going to start out with that. As I'll show you in a moment, the few treatments that are FDA approved uh, for bipolar depression uh, were all developed first for something else. The other thing that's fascinating is the prescribing trends over time. Now, almost every study and every guideline, thoughtful guidelines, where all of the evidence is put together, they all state that the main treatment for many people with bipolar disorder should be lithium. And yet what's happened from 2009 to 2016 is that the use of lithium has dropped, the use of antipsychotics has gone up, and as I'll show you in a moment, what's really remarkable is antidepressants have stayed about the same despite the lack of almost any evidence that they work any better than placebo for bipolar depression specifically. Just the way things are that people are prescribing that, and it may or may not be bad, and I'll explain that in a moment. So let's talk briefly about acute manic episodes before we get into depression together. And that's because you can't just treat the depression because the, the depression can lift and then someone can be vulnerable to switch over to mania. And there are many uh, treatments available for acute manic episodes. And those treatments are also available to prevent further manic episodes. And that's why many people who will be treated for bipolar depression may take a specific medication for bipolar depression, but they will also be taking a medication that may prevent mania. And lithium is the prototypical, quote, mood stabilizer, unquote, that can prevent the mania. So let's just very briefly go through some of these together. Uh, this is from a very nice review that my colleague Ross Baldessarini put together. And what Dr. Baldessarini did was he put together all of the controlled trials of treatment for mania and put them into these uh, specific categories. Looked at uh, 37 trials of antipsychotics, response rate, which usually refers to at least 50% improvement. The response rate was about 50%. It's so about half the number of people who are taking the antipsychotics uh, get better. Um, with lithium, seven trials, about the same. With anticonvulsants, which is usually valproate uh, or divalprox, you know, look, those numbers are really hovering around 50%, 49% around there. 
And so if you look at the antipsychotics response rates, lithium carbonate, anticonvulsants, and all the drugs together, right, it's about 49.5% response rates, about half the people will improve, which is substantially better than the proportion of people who improve with placebo, about twice as likely to improve with the medication than with not for acute mania. Right? So again, not to go through too much of the details here, but many of the people who'd be treated for bipolar depression will already be taking some antipsychotics, some lithium, or Dival Proex. One of those things that can, can treat acute mania and also prevent it from coming back. Now let's get into the treatments for bipolar depression. This is the great unmet need for bipolar depression. And it's a great unmet need because, as I'll show you in a moment, there are the treatments that are approved by the FDA, and then there are the treatments that are prescribed that aren't quite approved by the FDA, but they're used off-label, which is perfectly legitimate but the evidence base for using some of them may be more than the evidence base of the others. So let's get right into it and figure this out together. Now, the first thing is that my colleagues and I, earlier this year, published the prescribing trends for antidepressants in the treatment of bipolar disorder from 1997 to 2016. The top line here in blue is any antidepressant. And I'll show you in a moment, this is quite remarkable, that if anything, the proportion of patients from 1997 to 2016 treated with any antidepressant has gone up. So back in 97, it was about 47%. And back in 2016, it was then over 60%. So the trend has been going up. Now, if you look at the proportion of people who were taking an antidepressant without a mood stabilizer, like lithium or Valproex, that has actually been going also up, right? So that's been going up uh, for reasons unclear. And then the proportion who are taking it without an antipsychotic has been going down. What that means is that a lot of these people here who've been taking an antidepressant are also taking an anti-manic, anti-psychotic, right? So again, the antipsychotics originally uh, developed for psychosis, for hallucinations or delusions. They all have anti-manic effects. And that's why you might see people taking these multiple medications and might be taking antidepressants plus an antipsychotic. That being said, and I'll show you this in a moment, the only combination that has been approved by the FDA is the combination of the antipsychotic olanzapine and the antidepressant fluoxetine. One is assuming that any other antipsychotic mixed with any other antidepressant would be just as good, and a lot of people are prescribing that. So here is the amazingly short list of those drugs and combinations that have been approved by the FDA. I just mentioned the olanzapine fluoxetine combination, with olanzapine being the antipsychotic, fluoxetine being the antidepressant, uh, the trade name Zyprexa Prozac might be familiar to you. Uh, so that combination was approved. No other combination has been approved. Then there's Ketiapine, brand name Seroquel, Lorazidone, brand name Latuda, and Cariprazine, the brand name Vralar. So let's look at a little bit of the data. Again, I'm not going to show you too much. But there's a very nice review that my colleague Les Citrom just recently published. 
And I just want to forewarn you that one, when I'm showing these data, you can't quite compare these data because none of these have been directly compared. In fact, there's a type of research that's called comparative effectiveness, where people who have a disorder and presenting for care get randomized to competing treatments. And there has never been a study that directly compares these meds. And because the population of people who go into these studies are different, and because the placebo response rates can be different, you can't say that one is better than the other because the response rate is better in one group versus another. I really want to be clear about this. Uh, th this is very difficult to compare, and this is only an approximation of how the medications can perform. We need to be able to fund studies that actually look at this so we can know not only how do these medications compare, but can you match people to treatments? Because we don't know that yet. And it's got to be very frustrating, both for people who are have the experience of bipolar disorder and all of their treat, treaters to try to figure out, well, which medication do you choose? Uh, because there's really no guidelines, except perhaps the risk of side effects. So let's go through this together and we'll go through it carefully and slowly. Uh, so the, here's the response rate. And again, the response rate is defined as at least a 50% improvement in depression. And what you'll notice immediately is that each one of the FDA approved drugs, well, they, they get about 50% of people 50% better. Uh, and, and overall, that's really not too bad, uh, right? So it's about a 50% chance um, and again, it's, this is, you can't quite compare these, as I said earlier, because these are very different studies. But what we can do is at least look at the probability of the side effects. And if you look at the two side effects of weight gain and sedation, what really pops out is that the olanzapine fluoxine combination carries a great risk of weight gain. And it's because of the risk of weight gain, in addition to what's called the metabolic syndrome, where people not only have weight gain, but they can be pre-diabetic. It can make their glucose metabolism abnormal. It can also make it so that their blood lipids can be abnormal. Because of that, the use, the actual rate of prescription of lanzapine fluoxetine combined is extraordinarily low. And people do turn to either the ketiapine, lorazidone, or cariprazine because of that particular risk. Then if you look at the other meds, right, 8% chance of weight gain with these studies with ketiapine, and only two or 3% with lorazidone and cariprazine. And it is thought that lorazidone and cariprazine have a lower probability of causing weight gain. They still can do it, but it is most likely less of a risk with either olanzapine, fluoxetine, or ketiapine. All right, so again, response rates hover around 50% for people getting 50% better. There is a clear differentiation in the risk of weight gain greatest for olanzapine fluoxetine followed by ketiapine and lower for lorazidone or cariprazine. And then if you look at sedation, this is a little bit harder to define. And what I mean by that is that many of these studies will look at sedation at any given time. You know, did a person ever have sedation? And with this, what you'll see stands out is ketiapine. And what happens with ketiapine is some people can feel quite sedated when they start, but that tends to cool off 
over time. It also turns out that a lot of people will prescribe quetiapine for its sedative properties and it improves sleep, uh, not necessarily with daytime sedation. So you'd have to be careful with that. The olanzapine fluoxetine can also do similarly. And then if you look at the lorazidone and the cariprazine, it probably really is less. Now, again, you, you have to be careful about you know, really comparing these against each other. So it's a rough approximation because there hasn't been the direct comparison, but it can give you an overall sense of what the probability is. Now, just to make it more complicated, there are some people who really respond preferentially to the olanzapine fluoxetine, and they respond so well that they're willing to accept the weight gain and the sedation. So sometimes it's a very careful trade-off, and that trade-off is part of what I hope any of you who are being treated can do with your treaters. Negotiate about what you're willing to risk or not risk, and have a sense of the probability of helping versus the probability of causing some harm and a side effect. Now, that brings up another thing that Les Citrom talks about. And this is an interesting concept of the likelihood to be helped or harmed. And it's worthwhile going through this because I'm gonna show you some of the data for this. So what Les Citrom writes about, and this is a quote from his current paper, is that the likelihood to be helped to harm of 1.5 for response versus weight gain can be interpreted that, quote, acute olanzapine fluoxetine combination treatment is 1.5 times as likely to help with the therapeutic response versus harm the weight gain, right? So it's more likely to help with the therapy uh, therapeutic response than with the side effect of the weight gain. So keep this in mind, right? So it's one and a half times more likely to help than harm. So the higher that number, the higher this likelihood to be helped or harm, the more benefit versus harm that one will get. And I'm going to show you what Les talks about here. So here is a table of the likelihood to be helped or harm with very specific things. But let's look at this weight gain, because since we talked about it already, right? So here's the olanzapine fluoxetine 1.5, 1.5 times more likely to be helped or harm. With catiapine, with Seroquel, it's more than that. It's actually 2.7. With lorazidone, it's 11.6. So here's where the low probability of weight gain coupled with the higher probability of getting a benefit, it looks pretty good, right? And cariprazine, it's five, right? Five times more likely to be helped or harm. Let's look at the somnolence. Let's look at its ratio. And again, with olanzapine fluoxetine, three times more likely to be helped or harm. With catiapine, only a half because it causes a lot of somnolence. The Razidone 5, that's good. Cariprazine is pretty good. The other thing I just want to talk about here is akathisia. Akathisia is really feeling very physically restless, feeling a pressure to have to move. It's very uncomfortable for people. Wasn't calculated for lanzapine fluoxetine because the data weren't there. Gatiapine, about 5.7 times more likely to help than not. Uh, here, lorazidone doesn't look as good, right? So it's only three times more likely compared to the five here. And cariprazine, only 1.7 times more likely. So that means you can get benefit from cariprazine potentially at the cost of akathisia. Lorazidone, you can get benefits, but potentially at the cost of akathisia with less weight gain, less somnolence. And with catiapine, Oh, a little bit more likely, right? Again, a lower a lower number is not good. A higher number is good, right? 2.7 times more likely to have weight gain. So you so it's at the cost of that particular risk. So I went through this carefully because this is an approximation. It's a way to think about 
how these different treatments can be compared. But to me, it's rather shocking that there are only four drugs that are currently approved for bipolar depression, given the extent of its uh, prevalence and the problem that it has. Well, what about those treatments that are not FDA approved? As I mentioned before, other antidepressants with or without antipsychotics. There's also a widely used medication called lamotrigine or lamictal, which was originally an anticonvulsant. And lamotrigine or lamictal is approved for the prevention of mood episodes. But a lot of people give it for acute bipolar depression, even though there, was five, there were five studies done, one showed it worked, the other four didn't separate from placebo. But lamotrigine is tricky to study because it takes a long time to get up to the full dose. And the reason it takes a long time to get up to the full dose is that you have to titrate it, increase it slowly in order to minimize the uh, side effect of what's called toxic epidermal necrosis or Stevens-Johnson syndrome, very bad rash that can be dangerous. But if you start really low, 25 milligrams, take eight weeks to titrate up to 200 milligrams, then the risk is virtually eliminated. The other thing is not FDA approved, but is used for bipolar depression is electroconvulsive therapy. And uh, there are data that show it can really be extraordinarily helpful for people, even though it's not approved for that specific uh, indication. And the same with repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, there are limited data and some increasing data, especially from Scott Aronson um, in Maryland, that the RTMS, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, may in fact be quite useful. The other thing that can help is psychotherapy. And there are different forms of psychotherapy that can help. And uh, there are the, these uh, interesting books from my colleagues, uh, from Louisa Sylvia uh, and Stephanie McMurk-Roberts and also Tila Deckersbach, that show that, that there are ways that one be, may be able to do the therapy, either uh, the cognitive behavioral therapy, family focus therapy, mindfulness. There's something called the unified protocol for emotional regulation, dialectical behavioral therapy, and lifestyle interventions, all of which can be added to the treatment and can augment the treatment for bipolar depression. Well, what about potential new treatments? Some of you may heard about ketamine for major depression. There's also preliminary data that it can work for treatment-resistant bipolar depression. Then there's a very interesting drug borrowed from the Parkinson's world called Pramipexol, also known by the trade name Mirapex. And uh, there's, again, preliminary data that Pramipexol might be able to be helpful. Um, it does some things that are the opposite of antipsychotics. So one would think that's pretty interesting, but that needs to be developed further. There are only a few studies of that. Then there's an, there's an anti-diabetic drug called pioglitazone. And pioglitazone has been shown in randomized trials in at least three trials that it might be helpful for bipolar depression. It has its own side effects uh, th that uh, can cause weight gain and other things like that, but also very interesting is something completely different. My colleagues and I are studying basafibrate. Basafibrate is used to lower a type of blood, lip blood lipid, which is triglycerides. Um, and there's a complicated mechanism and we're just trying to do a proof of concept of that. Then interestingly enough, there's a preliminary data on minocycline, which is an antibiotic. Now it doesn't work for bipolar depression as an antibiotic, but it's because of what it does to one of the neurotransmitters called glutamate. Then there's a semi-naturalistic uh, 
uh, medication or something you can get at Whole Foods, which is N-acetylcysteine or NAC. And there's some preliminary data that can help in the long run if people take it chronically um, at fairly high doses with very few, if any, side effects. Um, and, and that's something interesting to see how that develops over time. And then there's something called nicotinamide riboside, which is incredibly fascinating because nicotinamide riboside has to do with energy regulation. Now, energy regulation is a whole area that is important for bipolar disorder because believe it or not, there are a lot of data that support a story. And the story is that bipolar disorder is not just a mood disorder, but instead is a disorder of how our brains and how our bodies use energy. And that how they use energy can be dysregulated at the level of the cellular powerhouses called the mitochondria. And nicotinamide riboside can improve the function of mitochondria. And by the way, so can basophibrate and probably pioglitazone. Uh, so maybe there's a really interesting story in there. And then there's another candidate, which is called candesartan. Um, and I won't go into that too much, but there's some cellular data that suggests, you know, maybe this is something that's worth looking into. So there's really a, an incredible hope that we can have a better understanding, not only of bipolar disorder, but also bipolar depression. Uh, there are large genetic studies that are being conducted. There are now approximately 60 genes that have been identified, but 60 genes makes the story very complicated. And we're still trying to understand what is the basic problem? What's the basic biological problem, the pathophysiology that's going on with bipolar disorder? And we need to do a lot more work. One of the pathways to understanding that is actually to do something that'll sound like science fiction, but now researchers can make neurons and little, connection, little collections of neurons that form connections called brain organoids that they can make from skin biopsies. And so the hope is that as this technology gets better, you can make these neurons and brain organoids from people who have bipolar disorder to understand functionally what is going on. And then again, in the future, if you then expose these neurons and brain organoids to the medications, you can see what they do differently versus not. There, there have already been several groups that have looked at how the neurons and brain organoids from bipolar patients react to lithium. And they found some differences in how those neurons and brain organoids respond differently to, from people who have responded to lithium or people who have not. There's also hope from big data, from electronic medical records and artificial intelligence. And my colleagues and I, in particular Melvin McGinnis over in Michigan and um, among other colleagues, uh, um, Kate Burdick over at Brigham and Women's Hospital and a whole host of other colleagues worldwide are trying to plan a bipolar global cohort collaborative to really understand the trajectory of bipolar disorder. Why do some people seem to thrive? Why do some people seem to suffer so much? And can we use that as a backbone to help develop better treatments for bipolar disorder and for bipolar depression? And lastly, I think the philanthropic support of the Brain Behavior Research Foundation is absolutely critical to this work. And as Jeff Bornstein said earlier and introduced this, it, it is of the most uh, um, innovative studies that are supported by the Brain Behavior Research Foundation. And I am grateful to them and thankful to them for their support.
and I urge everybody on on this call uh, to consider supporting BBRF because they, they've been so so terrific. So with Jeff, uh, that's all I have to say, and happy to take any questions. Uh, Andy, thank you very very much. This what an outstanding overview and presentation um, that I that I think people will find very very helpful. The uh, one of the challenges that um, that people with bipolar disorder have, and that family members have, um, is that sometimes people um, really have difficulty um, accepting the need for treatment. And I want to ask you to speak a little bit about that. And what should a family member do? if their loved one really doesn't have uh, full insight into the need for help. So I, I, I think that is a, a very common problem um, because sometimes people who have bipolar disorder can't see that they have it and they, they don't have the insight and don't really understand what may be going on. And I, th I think that overall there are two things that, that loved ones can do. One of the things that, that people can do uh, is just express concern and that they're concerned about them because they care and this is, this is what they're observing. And the other thing is a simple question. And the simple question is how are things working out for you? Are they working out the way you want them to, or are they not? And if they're really not working out and there are other problems, then you can suggest that they get some help for it. And I think with a persistent concern about how people are doing, coupled with that question, how's it working out for you? I think those are the things that can help. Very good, very good recommendation and guidance. And sometimes, if they Jeff, if the person a is able to identify bit. problem okay. X, while the family member might not view that as the main problem, oh, how is it now? How is it? We're picking just a, uh, just a little bit of static, but go ahead, go ahead. We good? Yep, go ahead, please. OK. Um, that, that often being able to um, have the person identify what they view as the problem, even if that's not the primary thing that the family sees, that might be a way to engage them. So I think that's very good advice. Given the, the statistics that you presented, about bipolar depression. Um, often people will not respond to the first line of treatment. What, what's the guidance? What, what are the steps that people should take in terms of if the first thing they try doesn't work, what should they think about next with their psychiatrist and, and uh, treatment team? Well, it, it all depends, and, and I'm not just trying not to answer the question, but it depends on what somebody has taken before, what they haven't taken before, and there are some very good guidelines, particularly from Canada, uh, called the CANMAT guidelines, that I, I think are very reasonable to help people think through what to do next. Um, but that's, oh, there's always a set of things that can be done next. And that's where you review the benefits and risks of each of the options. Good. That, very good. And I think the, could you, what is the reference that you just gave that people can look at? So, 
It's called CANMAT, C-A-N-M-A-T. And, and the uh, CANMAT guidelines uh, from Lakshmi Yatham from Vancouver, I think are among the best guidelines that exist. Good, good. Thank you for, for that reference. I want to talk about an important issue, um, which is the issue of suicide and suicide prevention. Um, and I'd like you to um, give us a little bit of information about the risks uh, that people with bipolar disorder may have and steps that they should take to reduce that risk. So the, the risk for suicide is associated with either uh, the depression or what's called a mixed state. And the mixed state is when you have a, a lot of manic symptoms with the depression. Uh, people can get very agitated. Now, you might think of how can you have both depression and mania at the same time, uh, but you can have a bunch of symptoms that are mixed together. The other thing that can happen is that people can have hallucinations or delusions. And, and so if they have depression, the big state, or if they have hallucinations or delusions, they're really very high risk. And sometimes it can be unpredictable. But I, I think having a very good uh, relationship with the treaters and having a plan for what should be done if somebody is really in that state judiciously and carefully using the patient unit as, as a way to help people when they're feeling that badly. Um, and the last thing is there, there's some interesting mixed data, but mostly positive, that lithium may have at least some anti-suicidal properties. But, but basically trying to systematically and carefully treat the episodes, prevent the episodes, have a good therapeutic relationship um, and to change treatment when needed. I think that, you know, that's a key point that if something isn't working to try something else carefully um, and to always be aware of these key issues, um, in particular suicide yes. risk. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about people who ask about lifestyle issues. What types of things can people do in their lifestyle, for instance, uh, maintaining a, a, a regular routine, make sure they get adequate sleep, et cetera. Talk a little bit about lifestyle, lifestyle uh, changes that people can make to uh, improve um, the symptoms. So it, get, it gets back to something you uh, you refer to, and and uh, what I call that is listen to your mother, and listening to your mother means get enough sleep, get exercise, eat your vegetables, eat well, don't drink too much alcohol, don't do drugs, and maybe have some period for quiet reflection and mindfulness, and those things combined can really reduce stress and help overall. And, and although it sounds like it's easy to do, you know, it's, it's difficult for many of us to try to eat as well as we can. Um, but if you use some simple principles of, of only eat real food that your grandmother would recognize, uh, minimize processed food and sweets, uh, that, that in and of itself can really help. The other thing, good sleep hygiene, try to wake up the same time every day. Uh, that alone can help a lot. And I, I can't underestimate the power of exercise and trying to be in good shape because that has a positive effect on brain physiology. I, I think all good guidance and certainly you know, listening to our mothers and grandmothers makes a lot of sense. Um, and the I can think of a number of people who I know who have bipolar disorder 
and a part of what's extremely helpful to them is taking control of their life in that way, whether it be exercise, sleep, um, eating habits, uh, mindfulness. So I think that's, those are all uh, very good suggestions. Um, the, uh, I want to ask you a little bit about early diagnosis. Um, often people retrospectively, after they've been diagnosed at an older age and in, in their young adulthood, can look back to their teenage years or even before and say, you know, I had things going on then and I just didn't know it, or the parents would say that. Could you talk a little bit about early diagnosis and then what should be done uh, when there is uh, a feeling that there may be um, bipolar disorder eminent? Sure, and, and that gets back to what I talked about earlier, which is the general concept of dysregulation. And when, when people look back uh, when they're adults and they look back to their adolescence and childhood, sometimes they recognize that their sleep was dysregulated, their anxiety was dysregulated, their irritability was dysregulated, uh, uh, their frustration tolerance was dysregulated. Uh, so sometimes it's, it's hard to put that all together because it's so nonspecific when people are children it can be a number of different things. Uh, so I, I think having a careful and systematic evaluation as, as soon as somebody recognizes something is going on can help people recognize it sooner. The, uh, finally, one, one more question. Often people with bipolar disorder are concerned about the potential risk of their children developing the disorder. And I'd like you to speak a little bit about that risk and what people should do with regards to this. So th there, there is a genetic risk. It is heritable. And, and essentially, uh, with their children, if there are some dysregulations that happen, uh, to get them evaluated uh, sooner rather than later. Um, one of the things that also that many people don't understand is that the most likely diagnosis that people's children can have is actually just depression. So it's not necessarily bipolar disorder, but more overall of a mood disorder, more likely to be depression than bipolar disorder. But I think having a low threshold for having their kids carefully evaluated by somebody who knows what they're doing, that can be helpful. Good, very good advice. Andy, I want to again thank you for an extraordinary presentation um, and even more importantly for the ongoing work that you're doing. Um, your work is having an impact and will certainly continue to have an impact on the lives of people uh, with bipolar disorder. So thank you very, very much for Thanks all that you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, um, Jeff. Appreciate it. Yeah. No, thank you. I also want to thank everybody who joined us today. 100% of all donor contributions for research are invested in our grants to scientists. All of the research we fund is made possible through supporters like you. So please consider making a gift by visiting our website, bbrfoundation.org, or calling us at 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion or would like to share it with family and friends, please visit the events and webinars page at our website. I also hope that you'll join us again in September when Dr. David Brent, Distinguished Professor of Psychiatry, Pediatrics, Epidemiology, and Clinical and Translational Science, as well as the Endowed Chair in Suicide Studies at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine will present Assessing and Managing Adolescent Suicidal Behavior, New Approaches. This webinar will take place on Tuesday, September 8th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Once again, thank you for joining us. Stay well and stay safe. Take care.